Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Three Strikes, written by the Cursor Hasn't Moved. And it came to pass that the foul Xenos did waken the giant, and the stars did tremble at a stamp. Her spear was made of ships most terrible. Her shields, tons of mobile armor, and justice, her sword, was girded at her waist. She striketh with her spear, and the Xenos did live by her restraint. Yet again the foul Xenos waken the giant, and she does shield their innocence with her shield for one last chance. But lo! See unto thine eyes, the Xenos learned not, as she draweth forth her terrible sword, Justice. The Republic in Fury, author unknown. It is not correct to refer to the humans as a homogenous block, but it is understandable to view them in aggregate from our side of the glass. They are, in fact, a multitude of star nations, independent planets, and alliances, loosely bound by a long series of treaties and agreements, mostly around what methods of kidding each other they will refrain from using. Yes, they still have intraspecies armed conflict, though from what I have read, that has been confined to criminal activity for the past century or so. Something that our nations are familiar with. Furthermore, it is also incorrect to think of their location as a uh, human space, as we often do. As there are multiple races in all of their star nations and unaffiliated planets, stations, and habitats. The histories of these races is worthy of a lecture of their own. But suffice to say that they are uplifted several animal species to sapiens, the doggos, the big kitties, and the chipmandos. I will be announcing the forthcoming lecture on the uplifts soon. But I desire to read further on this fascinating period of their history. The final race present are the Digitans, what we might term as AI with the crucial difference that they do not attempt to enslave or eradicate their progenitors. Again, another lecture will be forthcoming. No. Today I will be discussing the Republic's three-strike policy. For those of you who did not attend my previous lectures, the Republic of Terra and her aligned planets is the largest, wealthiest, and most powerful of the human factions. And you might remember their navy from the news of the eradication of the consumptive's threat. Yes, one faction of the humans created the glassed gulf. That might give you a hint about the subject of this lecture. It is perhaps startling that this information was freely included by the Republic in first contact information packet. But it is perhaps telling that they feel it necessary to make this known to those that might be potential threats to them or their allies. The policy is thus. If an enemy uses tactics and weaponry for the purpose of eradication of populations, they are deemed genocidal and thus deemed subject to the three strikes. During this stage, the actual policy is not actually in effect, but rather a precursor policy called Total War in which the normal restrictions on the weapons and tactics the Republic allows themselves no longer apply. Yes, you heard that correctly. The Republic of Terra and her aligned planets possess weapons and fighting doctrines that they normally forbid themselves on their own initiative, without regard for reciprocation, unless eradication is the enemy's goal. The hope of total war is to force the enemy into signing an unconditional surrender in which they will be made aware of the strike one is being applied. The first strike is the confinement of the total surviving population of a race on their cradle world, and the denial of all spaceflight capabilities for a span of three complete generations. The hope is that with time and the memory of total military defeat hanging over them, the subsequent generations will be raised to avoid aggression action 
against the Republic or her allies, thus making the hostile entity in turn into a neutral one, or even a friendly one. The Republic states, however, that they do not interfere with the race's internal affairs during this period, and they have several examples of different human factions attempting to alter the politics of opposing factions by force and its various levels of failure. They've adopted a, a hard lesson stance in terms of averting genocidal factions opposing them or their allies. The information of just what Strike 2 and Strike 3 entail are also made clear to the defeated enemy. To that point, Strike 2 is triggered if after a warning meant to remind the enemy faction that they are on probation, as it were. The enemy faction continues aggressive actions against the Republic or her allies. If the second strike is fully triggered, the Republic becomes far harsher in its reprisals than the mere confinement of all surviving population on the Cradle World. Instead, they forcefully remove a stable breeding population to a habitable world that is completely lacking in infrastructure of uh, any kind. Provide the most basic agricultural technology, including hand tools, seeds, livestock if applicable, and manuals on how to farm legible to the faction in question. You may be wondering how harsh removing a portion of a population that any space-faring civilization would barely notice could be a harsh reprisal. But the reprisal isn't the removal of this population, but the total eradication of the rest of the faction. I see you are properly shocked. But recall that this policy is only in place for enemies who attempt the eradication of the Republican worlds, station, habitats, and other applicable dwelling place, or those of her allies. My reading of the Republican historical record reveals that unlike us, the humans did not emerge into a region amongst potential friends and rivals, but were beset by horrors instead. A hive mind which attacked without warning and only after the destruction of several of what are only theorized as queens did these insectoids realize that humanity could not simply be swept aside by their drones. Beings of pure energy who tore through their nations and either couldn't or wouldn't communicate. Never to be seen or heard from again. Once they had passed through, Cephalopods, who saw their young as delicacies, and absolutely refused to surrender, just to name three of the most famous examples. Even now, several races are undergoing Strike 1 confinement, and another is under Strike 2 confinement. But I see now you realize that in the face of existential threat that simply refuses to learn to not attack, there can only be one result. Strike 3 is the total eradication of a hostile force via orbital bombardment, such as the parasitic consumptives and thus the glassed gulf. Now, the consumptives aren't weren't an enemy so much as they were a force of nature, an abomination that cannot coexist with any other form of animal life. But their ships possess the capability to wipe all life from a planet and they consider the expenditure of the resources and the loss of the potential or useful planets worth it. It should be noted that one of the treaties amongst the other factions of humanity and their companion races is one of mutual defense from genocidal enemies. So in the case of the eradication attack against any human planet, station, or habitat would trigger total war. I should also like to inform you that our diplomats have recently agreed to this agreement between the Star Council and the Republic. So, in addition to being just the cutest, they are potentially very good friends to have indeed. Transcript of the public lecture of the Three Strikes Policy by an independent scholar on Verdura. End of story. Story number two. Hidden Potential, written by Battlelox underscore. The planet below slowly smoldered, as it had for hundreds of years. It spun slowly, almost peacefully, but its appearance belied the true reality of the surface. 
From a distance, it looked like a dull gray ball with hints of brown, poking through where the dark swirling clouds momentarily parted. Jaws' breath frogged the view window as she stared at it. She could hardly believe that it had once been the same bright blue marble that was pictured on a wall near. The tour guide droned on. Unfortunately, little is known of the most of the species that existed on Earth. How scientists believe that life was once abundant there, but with such diversity of flora and fauna that has never existed anywhere else in the galaxy since. However, the surface is so radioactive that it can hardly be studied. The tour group moved on to the next exhibit. A large vehicle, cut in half to show the interior, sat ominously. Its walls were made of thick steel, and Jaw could hardly believe such a large vehicle could move. The walls of this rover are thick enough to provide a few moments of protection to research teams, but even so, studies on the surface are extremely dangerous. No individual can stay on the planet for more than a quarter of a planet's days, and after only three expeditions, they will have received the maximum safe dose of radiation. The tour guide cleared his throat. <coughs> Now, uh, can anyone tell me what happened to Earth? Joel's hand shot up. The, the Styran invasion. That is correct, young one. Very well done. The Styrans, against the Federation's decree, chose to invade and conquer Earth to enslave the population and exploit its resources. The dominant life form on the planets, the human, put up an extremely strong resistance, despite their laughably insufficient technology. The group ambled to the next room, which was full with recovered human artifacts behind thick glass. This right here is the most common human weapon, a rudimentary projectile launcher. Small metal bullets were propelled by a controlled explosion. They were mostly ineffective against the Styran ships, but were cheap, mass-produced, and easy to operate. Beyond that, the humans had even larger versions that launched explosives, which took down many Styran ships. Unfortunately for the humans, their brave resistance was not enough to stop the invasion. So rather than surrender their planet, they decided to scorch the Earth, killing all life. The surface is blanketed in radiation and violent storms and will continue to be uninhabitable for thousands of years to come. How did it happen? Another member of the tour asked, horrified. I mean, if they only had these rudimentary launchers, how did they manage to destroy the surface? Well, uh... The humans had just started to develop nuclear energy technology, the guy responded. Nuclear energy? I I isn't that safe? Humans, as it turns out, uh, developed a way to create a limited runaway fusion reactions, but released nuclear energy into the uncontrolled bursts, so-called nuclear bomb. Several of the clans of humans had amassed a great number of these weapons and detonated them all over the surface. The tour group muttered quietly at the devastation. What a loss, someone murmured. Indeed, the guide said. We have may never know what potential the humans had or even know how many species they took with them to their graves. Fortunately, a portion of their ticket expenses will be... Their orbital observation stations intercom crackled to life. Greetings, interlopers! The voice was harsh, grating, and extremely loud, but it spoke their language in a halting, stilted way. You thought us dead, but we cannot die. We hid, waited, listened, and rebuilt. Jaw moved to the window and watched as pinpricks of light appeared on the surface of the dead planet. You sought to take our land from us, but it is ours, and we will cleanse it. The tour guide's commune jabbered rapidly at him. Evacuate the station immediately. Incoming projectile. Repeat, evacuate the station immediately. The harsh voice continued. We will reclaim it! Jaw backed away from the view window, but it was too late. And we will have our revenge! End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Dragzoon WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catull, Lord Ashrakal, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.